morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are uh, at this time in different parts of the world. Um, you are tuning in to the lecture that is part of the Yingchen Distinguished Lecture Series on Buddhism, hosted by Harvard Chem Lab. I'm Eugene Wang, director of Harvard Chem Lab. Before we introduce our speaker, uh, two announcements. In this Zoom web seminar, webinar, we have two language channels, uh, both in English and Chinese. You can click on the interpretation button on the menu bar and choose either English or Chinese. In addition to this Zoom webinar, we also have live streaming channels. Um, so you can uh, click on the chat box uh, that you can find on the menu bar, you have three choices. You have YouTube uh, Chinese, YouTube English, and you have a Facebook that is in both Chinese and English. After the um, speaker gives the lecture and we have two discussions, I will introduce them um, after the lecture. And, um, so there will be a Q&A session and you can post your questions in the Q&A box. It's, again, you can find that in the menu box. Today, we're gonna have a very distinguished speaker and the theme of the topic of today is exploring the future of Buddhism through a historic perspective with reference to the Tsuji school of Buddhism. Our speaker today is Ray Sheng He, who is Deputy CEO of Buddhist Siji Charity Foundation. And he's also a colleague of mine, associate of Harvard FS Kamla. Uh, his lecture today will ask big questions, um, cued in part by the well-known story of the dis disappearance of Bud Indian Buddhism during and before the 13th century and the decline of Chinese Buddhism after the Ming Dynasty. So Mr. He will be asking or reflecting on the question of modernization of Buddhism. What can Buddhism do? Um, what did it do in the past? What can it do in now? And he'll also reflect on the question of to what extent the global outreach and impact of Buddhism in this day and age when people yearn for spiritual practice and organizations have resources to do things that make the world a better place. And he will also reflect on the future of Buddhism and reflect upon uh, how Buddhism can adapt to and make more impact on our modern society. Professor Ho, uh, Rishen Ho, as I said, is the deputy CEO of uh, Buddhist uh, Tsuji Charity Foundation, and he's an associate professor at the Tsuji University and National Chenzi University. He was a spokesperson and director of the Department of Literature and History of the Tsuji Foundation. He received his PhD in philosophy from Peking University, Master of Art on Communicative Communication Management, the Edinburgh School for Communication and Journalism for the University of Southern California. As a veteran media professional, he was a senior news anchor and TV program producer. The documentary he produced, Great Love as Running Water, the history of bone marrow transplantation, was selected as best documentary at the Pacific Asian and African regions of Emmy Awards International in 2004. Dr. Her has delivered speeches on Buddhism and NGO management at Harvard University, University of Oxford, Peking University, Renmin University of China, uh, Be Beijing Normal University and the University of Hong Kong and many other international uh, symposiums. So uh, we are very pleased 
to have him as the distinguished speaker uh, for this uh, Yingsun Distinguished Lecture Series. Now, um, uh, without much further ado, uh, here's Dr. Her. Thank you, Professor Eugene Wang, and um, my dear colleague, Professor Richard Madison, and Professor Alice DeVito, and all scholars upon the university's uh, Yingzheng Lecture Series, and my Harvard colleague, Chiji colleague, and Dai TV crew, and all scholars, students, Buddhist practitioners, and all our friends in Chiji and in Buddhist Sangha, and especially the Jing Shi Bo, most respected Dharma Master Zheng Yang, and all masters and pure practitioners, welcome, and thank you for your attendance. I'm honored to be invited by Harvard University Camlab to be the second lecturer of the Yingzhen Distinguished Lecture Series on Buddhism. Today I'm going to share with you the topic exploring the future of Buddhism through a historical perspective with a reference of Tsuji School of Buddhism. In the history of Buddhism, what did come to an end in India? What did it decline in China? in the Ming and Qin dynasty after 1900 years of its existence. Indian Buddhism originated uh, in 2006 years ago, when the Buddha traveled around the India advocating rational cognition and transforming the decrying mysticism of the Brahmins into a rational moral practice. With the Eightfold Path, and for immeasurable mind to achieve ultimate enlightenment. The Buddha was like Socrates, who redeemed Greece from mythology toward rational cognition, and also like Confucian, who transformed the sacrifice to heaven into the way of heaven. As Karl Jasper, the German existentialist philosopher, observed, they were in the exile age of mankind progress toward rational civilization. Master Ying Sun, on the other hand, mentioned that in the later century, senior Hmong and intellectual moved forward to the exploration of esoteric mindfulness instead of returning to the mundane world and constructing a system of knowledge. The esoteric philosophy of mindfulness is inaccessible to ordinary people who can then turn to Tangra, spell, incantations, and gradually assimilate it into Brahmins. The demise of Indian Buddhism in the 13th century must be attributed to the fact that in its middle and late stage, Indian Buddhism overemphasized abstract philosophy of mind and monotistic self-cultivation, and they lack a universal knowledge system and value system. The emphasis on the management of monk and the lack of attention to the life of lay followers, as Master Weber said, was the key to the demise of Buddhism in India. According to Master Weber, Buddhism did not establish a secular community of lay followers. In the past, Buddhism in India emphasized the practice of monasticism and the management of the monastic community, but not the management of the lay person. In short, it failed to build an organized community of lay followers. Weber say that the demise of Buddhism was due to two factors. First, the lack of organized community of lay followers. The second is a lack of secular, rigorous ethical life. The reason for the decline of Buddhism in the Ming and Qin dynasty in ancient China after 1900 years of its existence was the overemphasis of monastic temple, leaving the system of worldly knowledge to Confucianism, with the pursuit of the way of officialdom and business. The lack of worldly value and knowledge system in Buddhism led to its demise. The return to moral practice, as originally advocated by Buddha, mean not searching for esoteric experience, but the daily practice that bring in the deep and subtle joy 
of the Dharma in a peace, stillness, and void of desire. And it should be one of the most rigorous group of the lay Buddhist follower in the world. Further, to build the ten precepts of Chiji and the ethical code of lay people. This is different from Indian Buddhism and Chinese Buddhism, which focus on monastic practice and monastery management. Where the monk were in San Barrow and believers who came to the devotion to the temple, without returning Buddhism to the secular world and without a rigorous secular organization. To help the world, the four mission and eight endeavors of Chiji lead believers from altruism to self enlightenment, from the material improvement of all beings to the purification and elevation of the mind. This religious practice has been a unique trend in the history of Buddhism. Buddhism began around the 6th century BCE at the time of rapid political and economic transformation and disintegration in India, Paurova Kingdom, politically the kingdom which has lasted for more than 10 centuries, was divided into 16 kingdoms in North India. This state was attempting to dominate all of India, the democratic state of Vajji and the monarchical state of Magadha, fighting for supremacy. The Indian economy was in heyday, with the monastery economy replacing the Cato based economy, the power of commerce, Fulton Kingdom, and the king employed legislation to prevent the erosion of political power by commerce. The wealthy were increasingly insecure, and they would be raided by political power at any time. In terms of faith, Brahmin experienced great civilization construction of architectural, logic, medicine, geometry, astronomy, law, and incantation in the 10th century BC and formed a comprehensive Vedic canon. Nonetheless, in the 6th century BC, the hereditary Brahmin power declined. The Vedic doctrine became dogmatized from the original one and its practice stripped from the knowledge of truth to mysticism. In a period of political and economic turmoil, the Brahmin were not able to offer a solution. It was during the period that the Buddha, who witnessed the chaos in the India, advocated rationalism that a rational moral life was the basis for life and enlightenment. His solution was not in politics, not in the economy, not in the world, but outside the world. It was by detachment from everything in the world and then return to the world to be a model for people. Through the Buddha, purity and selfless, as A.K. Walter say, he and other philosophers of the time look alternative for a solution, not primarily in society, but in the first place away from it, and in fact, they contracted out of society in order to preserve their freedom. They abandoned the quest for wealth and power and sought peace of mind and spiritual transcendence. Only from an independent vantage point could they hope, as they certainly did hope, to exercise as influence the society they had left and to infuse into better ideal than mourning and violence. At that time in India, there were two types of practitioners, the Brahmins and the Samana. Brahmins want to learn Veda classic and the ritual of sacrifice and the truth of immortality. As a completing study, they will have a family and retire to the forest in their later years, living a roving life. The Samana, on the other hand, is a new kind of non Brahmin practitioners and so-called diligent people who give up homes, beg for food, travel to the world, practice ascetic yoga, and pursue meditation to achieve the transcendence of life and death. The Buddha belonged to a branch of this new religious practice. Buddha Sakyamuni also means the enlightened one in the Jain teaching. 
The 49 years when the Buddha preaches was the period of primitive Buddhism. According to Master Insun and Japanese scholar Akira Hirakawa, the original Buddhism came about 100 years after the Buddha's entry near Nirvana. And before the second gathering and the split of the Sangha, the sectarian Buddhism spanned from the first century BC to the fourth century, roughly 500 years, according to the scholars. Then there will be Mahayama, or so called Mahagasamgika, and the Theravada and Hinayana and contemporary Buddhism. Humanist Buddhism and other Buddhism development in the early years of the 20th century in China. The Buddha at the beginning built a democratic, free, autonomous community. The monastic community life from the twice monthly Upavasata to the promulgation of Pati Mokasha was discussed by all members through assembly ritual and a form of transparent consensus decision making. The Buddha did not attempt to establish a strong central management organization. The second book of the long discourse, Dirk Agama, the Buddha was nearly 80 years old and feeling not well. Since there were no disciples around, he felt obligated to hold on for some time. When Ananda returned from the fetching water and saw that Buddha was quite exhausted, he immediately held wide the Buddha's body, and after the Buddha had recovered his spirit a little, Ananda eagerly asked the Buddha for Dharma. O oh Buddha, he said, do you have any teaching for the monastic community? After your Nirmana, who do you think will lead the monastic community? Do you want to give any explanation or instructions? The Buddha said, do the monk need anything from me? Do you need me for the future of the monastic community? The Buddha went on, I am also only a member of the Sangha. And for the past 40 more years, my teaching has been given to each and every one of you fairly and openly. If any of you think and say that I can preside over the Sangha, and the Sangha is willing to be held by me, and the Sangha should be laid by me, then you should turn to the person. I am just an old man about to die. What do I have to say to you? O oh, Ananda, the Buddha said, be kindled by yourself, not by others. Be saved by our, yourself, not by others. Be converted into Dharma by yourself, not by others. The Buddha Sangha was a democratic, autonomous, and egalitarian organization. All the Dharma by Buddha returned to the self-nature and self-interpretation by the disciple. The Buddha did not want his disciple to believe in him, but in his Dharma. His Dharma is the objective truth. And he wants his disciple to believe in the objective truth that has realized as stated in Connected Sutra Samyukata Agama. Buddha told his disciple, the law of independent arising is neither created by me nor by any other. O Buddha, whoever existed, or will be existed, awaken the law of interdependent origination by themselves. The Buddha idea cover economic, governance, psychology, and ethic, but his disciple did not expound his ideal fully and not to apply to solve the secular world. In my book, The Economy of Goodness, I expounded the Buddha's viewpoint on the economy of six no doubt and the full sufficiency. The Agama emphasized the full sufficiency for economy life. The full sufficiency include expediency sufficiency, that means commercial professional capability. Second, protection sufficiency is safeguarding property and wealth. Third, good knowledge advises sufficiency to ensure joyful life with a low relationship. Fourth, Right livelihood sufficiency is mean to live within a mindful life with purity and reason. This four sufficiency cover 
comprehensive way to wealth and happiness in the economy. The Buddha was an eloquent philosopher, and wherever he traveled, he gave talk on various topics to the wise and people at the large. However, in the history of Buddhism, the Buddha's ideal on poverty, law, art, business has rarely been mentioned, discussed, or extended. The Buddha's idea of the Bodhisattva path to improve the world gained influence in the Mahayama Buddhism period, which, however, still focus on giving the Dharma in relieving worldly suffering and lack an overall construction of the worldly knowledge and value system. We can trust this issue back to the preference of the disciple of primitive Buddhism. For the transmission of Dharma at the Buddha's nirvana and their preference for doctrine during the Buddhist sectarianism. In his book, The Region of Theory of Conscious Only, Master Ying Sun said that primitive Buddhism did not emphasize material giving, but mainly on the teaching of Dharma. That means giving the Dharma rather than worldly material improvement and gratification. Providing the way to liberation from the world was the fundamental teaching of primitive Buddhism. Primitive Buddhism did not have a rigorous organization of lay people, a system of knowledge for constructing the world, or a system of ethic for lay people to follow. According to the Theravada, the seven disciples of the Buddha, including the lonely elder, and other about 500 followers, consider the early organization of Buddhist follower. However, there is no record of such organization and strict rituals for followers. As in the twice monthly Upavasata of the Sangha, there are more than 200 precepts for bhikkhus and more than 500 precepts for bhikkhunis. The five precepts aside, there is no strict code of conduct for lay followers like precept for lay Brahmins. What did the Buddha expect for the lay follower? We know that Buddha expected monk to be uncontaminated arhat. Yet while the Matayama classic expect arhat to attain ultimate enlightenment and Buddhahood through Bodhisattva path. So what did the Buddha expect of followers, of lay person? How do we understand the cultivation of lay followers. Let's take an example of the most powerful disciple of the Buddha, the lonely elder. He bore a garden in the capital of Savasti in the kingdom of Kosala for the Buddha and his disciple to live in. The garden was so huge and acquisite. It is recorded in the Buddhist scripture that the lonely elder bore this garden with the payment of gold for the Buddha. The Buddha and his disciples spend a lot of time here and for summer and sermons. Given to Brahmins was considered to be a great blessing, a notion that was not necessarily emphasized at the time of the Buddha. However, the concept of giving alms to gain Mary was still believed by Buddha's lay followers, rather than elaborate rule of life as in the scriptures. Lay follower practice arm giving, good deeds, and five precepts. The Buddha teaching to the lonely elder mainly revolve around the concept and the practice of giving, holding precepts, and having realm. The concept blessing seemed to be Buddha's teaching to lay followers. This means by benefiting the community and providing for the monk, lay follower may ascend to heaven. Is recorded in connected discourse, Semukata Agama, that after death the lonely elder, with his body come down from the glow from the Tushita heaven to meet the Buddha. Eventually, what the Buddha expects of a lay follower is still the path of liberation, not the pursuit of worldly attainment. In connected sutra, Samyukta Agama, the Buddha was carrying a bow to the city of Sivasti and happened to arrive at the home of the lonely elder, who was seriously ill at the time. But still, 
the lonely elder pay homage to the Buddha and wanted to provide for him. The Buddha accepted the offering in silence. The Buddha showed the way to be free from suffering with endurance keeping the holy precept. The Buddha granted the lonely elder stage of non-returner, the third order of arhatship. The Buddha's expectation of the lonely elder was that he would be free from suffering of this world and attain wisdom and liberation to attain the arhatship, this stage of ascent. The Buddha say in Sutra of infinite meaning that as the suffering has been removed and the Dharma will be taught. It seems that Buddha's thought in the Mahayama classic to remove material pain before teaching Dharma. But did the doctrine of primitive and sectarian Buddhism lack such an ideal of removing the worldly suffering? When we look upon to what extent the Buddhism impact the secular world, we should mention the king of Asoka. Asoka was the third king of Pika dynasty. It was the primitive Buddhist period. Asoka built tens of thousands of stupa during his reign to enshrine the Buddha's relic and divided the relic of the eight kings who built their own stupa into 14,000 stupa throughout the India. It was time when stupas were in their prime. Asoka waged numerous war in his early reign, but after converted to Buddhism, he imposed a ban on killing in the court and kitchen, and he began a vegetarian diet. For prisoners on death row, there were three days of repentance before execution. Asoka promoted the prohibition of killing and peace in general. Asoka taught his people the importance of honesty and filial piety and encourage lay people to enter a temple for sure cultivation. Asoka himself also entered the temple for sure period of time. Asoka pacifism contributed to the small northern kingdom in abolishing the death penalty and stopping war. When Asoka was alive, he sent many monks to the island of Ceylon, Burma, Thailand to preach Buddhism. He contributed greatly on the development of world Buddhism. Asoka even promulgated the Dharma, which was carved on stone pillar throughout the whole India. The Dharma Asoka provides is not a cumbersome law, but a life philosophy that incorporated the Buddhist thought. Buddhist temple flourished under Asoka, and the state system followed the guidance of the Dharma. But Asoka failed to establish a secular system for Buddhist followers. As a result, Buddhism failed to replace Brahminism. It's a historical fact that the practical aspect of life was still mastered by Brahmins. Asoka was betrayed by his minister and princess in his latter year. And after his death, his grandson abandoned Buddhism and India returned to Brahminism. Soon, the Pika dynasty fell too. Max Weber's study point out that from the time of the Buddha to the Mahayama Buddhism, a rigorous community of lay followers was not established, nor was the spirit of Buddhism integrated into mundane life. A comprehensive ethical system of life was not constructed. Even when Asoka revealed Buddhism and converted to it, he still honored the Brahmin and provided them with a great deal of arms. Although Buddhism influenced the royal court, social ritual, and ceremony was still in the hands of Brahmins. Buddhism provided the path to water liberation by lack of comprehensive system of knowledge about the reality of the world, so led the Brahmin with a firm grip on much of the social life. In the 9th century BC, before the birth of Buddha, a group of Brahmin thinkers and poets reinterpreted the classic Vedic text and made innovation in their exposition. Veda was a collection of Brahmin knowledge. In fact, Veda are not a single classic, but a collection of classic complied by monks of various sects, including epic poetry, 
science, logic, astronomy, economy, architecture, all forming a huge system of knowledge for Brahmanism, involving many social aspects. In the 9th century BC, the Brahmin world-oriented knowledge system was already complete. As a result, Brahmin became a religion, a culture, a civilization, and a way of life. The Brahmin constructed a vast knowledge system and social value in the fourth century before the birth of Buddha. Not only various professional secular knowledge was dominated by Brahmins, but also the law penetrated deeply into Indian society. The code of ethic established by Brahmin in the 11th century BC, commonly known as the Law of Manu, has more than 2,600 articles governing social lifestyle and ethical code. The code of ethic is rooted in the core of Indian society and become a fundamental part of people's life and social culture. Even the Soka's policy of Buddhism cannot shake it. The code of ethic was always embedded in the mind of Indian during the period of Buddha's flourishing and including the later Muslim rule or the Mongol Empire. Therefore, during Asoka's time, the upper level of thought was Buddhism, but the technical and norm of life were dominated by Brahminism. Even Buddhism prevailed, the caste system never disappeared in India. In this way, Buddhism deepened its dependence on the Brahmins, including the Vedic art, spirituality, and expertise. Thus, during the time of primitive Buddhism, the Buddha was revered by king, but the king of Pataliputra still believed in the Brahmins as their teachers. The king worshipped the Buddha on one hand, but worshipped God like Brahma and Indra in the pantheon of Brahminism. India was pursuing Buddhism spiritually while living in the hands of Brahminism at the time. The core sectarian Buddhism, Pratyeka Buddha, Japan scholar Akira Hirakawa think that sectarian Buddhism is the Buddhism of disciple, the Buddhism of learning position, not the Buddhism of teaching people. The sectarian Buddhist teaching are characterized by devotionalism, where monk observe the precept, pray for the way of liberation, and do not pursue real world improvement in its application directly. Monk practice in vast temple garden, abstaining from sex and seek liberation. The king and merchant give huge support and arm to the monk, so that they would concentrate on their spiritual practice without any worries. At the time, the advantage of Buddhism is that provide a stabilizing force for merchant travel from country to country to face various dangerous challenges planting good rules and obtain good result. By giving alms and making offering to monks, they gain blessing. Compared to Brahmins' emphasis on ritual and prayers, Buddhism rational thinking and practice give the merchant the courage and calm wisdom they needed to go through danger and hardship. In addition, the caste system of Brahmin was not suitable for commercial relations with the foreigners. So the merchant came into contact with the various ethnic groups and classes. Buddhism, with its emphasis on equality, became the faith to which the merchant class adhered. By contrast, the peasant followed Brahminism directly. So as the just stated, although the king and wealthy merchant believe in Buddhism, Sectarian Buddhism devotes too much of its energy not to establishing a new order of world and a new set of law for the lay people, but to debating over the sutra in the monasteries. It was prevalent belief then, and through later generation too, that the Abhidharma focused on the correct interpretation and the understanding of scriptures. The construction of broader world oriented the knowledge system for the lay follower was lost. In contrast to Buddhism, 
the 2,685 articles of the Code Manual that are written by Brahmins has always been the norm of ethical order for all classes and are entrenched in all levels of Indian society. Brahminism thus is not a social class, but a social institution. The rise of Buddhism did not provide an ethical code of social life. The rise of Buddhism under Soka weakened the power of Brahminism only in temporary. But as long as the class order and ethical norm remained in place and was still in the hand of Brahmins, Buddhism as an avant-garde ideal failed of the all to penetrate into a secular life of people and failed to establish a new ethic and much less to construct new social institutions. The effort of Brahminism finally regained power in a Gupta empire. At this time, Brahminism and Buddhism were eventually matched. Numerous doctrines uh, from the second century AD show that the royal family donated a large tract of land to the Brahmins and all Brahmin products were tax-free. After the 7th century AD, Brahmin gradually revived and eventually brought Buddhism into history in India. If Mahayama Buddhism is a Bodhisattva path that entered the world, what did die out eventually after about 900 years of development? If Matayama, the Bodhisattva, replaced Pratyeka Buddha, become the model of worship for Mahayama Buddhists, the Buddha took on human form, and Bodhisattva took on various forms to rescue sensual being. What is the meaning of saving sensual being? The majority of Mahayama Buddhist relief of sensual being is given the Dharma and providing the practitioner with a path to liberation from the world. What is the Mahayama Buddhist view for the lay people practice? As Meta Yinshun say, the trustworthy Upasika and Upasika are the holy one who see the normal truth. So the Sangha can be assisted for lay followers to maintain the purity of the Sangha. He said that Tisa Magaliputta had returned to Asoka for solving the dispute of monastic community, which confirmed the record in great canon of monastic rule in the early days. The monastic community and the lay people love each other in harmony. If a monk offend a lay follower by violating reasonable ethic, and he even had to go to follower home to apologize, and this was so-called happy ritual. However, over time, with the repeated emphasis on the superiority of being monk, the harmonious integration of being monk and lay follower in primitive Buddhism gradually disappeared. As early as in Uttarpataka, there were lay arhat, meaning that lay follower could also attain arhatship like monk. The Mahayama Buddhism flourished. Lay follower also collaborated in companion Buddhist texts. In the early year of Mahayama Buddhism in India, normal women and upper class supported the Buddhism. However, because of this, the monk who originally settled in a property-free life grew dependent on socially entitled class. They became less willing to leave the human world, in other words. The large lumber offering made the monk who were otherwise out of the world slowly enter secular world. However, in entering secular society, the monk did not build a secular value system based on Buddhism. The secularized monk become dependent on worldly wealth instead of providing a code of conduct and a system of knowledge, value, and organization for the worldly society. The point I'm making here is that at the time of Mahayama Buddhism, including Burma, Thailand, and Ceylon, Sri Lanka, the power of the king was combined with the power of the monk but did not bring 
universalization of Buddhism, Dharma, well, not necessarily, it brought more of higher archization of Buddhism. In the formation of the authority, hierarchy, and region of Buddhist monk, Weber's study point out that king effectively tempts society at the large through monks and Buddhism. On the earthly level, Buddhism assisted in establishing secular power and dominating the life of the people. The people worshiped the monk, both for their practice and for the magical power they possess. The ruler relied on the monk for ruling rather than allow the spirit of the monk to prevail in the life of the masses. That's why I thought it was about the formation of regime, authority, and hierarchy of Buddhism, rather than universalization and socialization of Buddhism. At the time, Brahmanism and Buddhism were just opposed in India, and the statue of Brahma, Indra, and Buddha were displayed side by side on the bank of Ganges River. Around the 7th century AD, when Master Xuan Zhuang went to India to obtain scriptures, he called the India a Brahmin country. At that time, the king of Kosala worshipped the Buddha as well as the god in Brahminism. Although the upper social level practiced Buddhism, social life was in the hand of Brahmins who developed their professional system. Moreover, as far as the high intellectual were concerned, the Buddha did not stress on discipline. The Surangama Sutra, someone asked the Buddha many questions, and the Buddha asked him a thousand questions in return. To let go of doubt, no over dialectic thinking, non austerity, but a middle path in the moral practice of daily life. Yet, in the later development of Buddhism, the intellectuals of upper class in India were fond of dialectic thinking, and Brahminism provided a philosophical foundation for it. The king, including those of the city Pataliputra, revealed the Buddha teaching, but still honored the Brahmin texts as their teachers. The juxtaposition of Buddhism and Brahminism is becoming increasingly distinct in Mahayama Buddhism. In the latter year of Mahayama Buddhism, Buddhist monk focused on the theory of consciousness only. It is a system of deeper understanding of the nature of mind. This profound system of mindfulness is now accessible to common people. I call this as the Buddhist superior spiral for the high level monk diving into study of consciousness rather than a worldly system of knowledge and values. From primitive Buddhism to Theravada Buddhism, including the Mahayana Buddhism, as Master Ying Sun said, they do not value much on the improvement of material world. The development that made Buddhism gradually move away from the life of the general public. The common people do not have access to the ethical system given by Buddhism at the secular level, so they move toward the mystic art in the various mantra and the tantra of Brahmin. In the beginning, the Buddha was trying to overthrow the mysticism and diversification in Brahmins with the rationalism and moral practice. However, after the worship of the holy relic, the use of holy water, incense and candle, rosary, vestment, mantra for prayers, relic of sand, purification, and chanting for the dead were all adopted by the faithful Buddhist followers. And the ritual and mysticism of Buddhism and Brahminism merged. All this mysticism has been an ancient Indian tradition, and after the Buddha's death, more than a thousand years, he has returned to the mainstream of society. Committing on the merger of Buddhism and Hinduism, Will Duran said, Buddha, like Protestant Luther, had made a mistake of supposing that the Dharma or religious ritual could be replaced with the sermon and morality. And the rich in myth, miracle, ceremony, and intermediating sand 
seem to have appeared before Buddha. But eventually, the older faith poured into the younger one. If Buddhism was to take over so much from Hinduism, so many of its legend, its right, and its god, soon very little would remain to distinguish these two religions. The monks specialized in a theory of conscious only and move forward a more profound philosophy of mind. Instead of popularizing Buddhism, and the common people went to Hinduism mysteries and incantations. Thus, Buddhism already died out in the 13th century, expounded by Master Weber and Master Yin Sun. The final blow to the dismiss of Buddhism was the Muslim invasion of India. The Muslim Sultan massacred Buddhist monk, destroyed Buddhist monasteries and burned libraries. Since the 10th century AD, temples, gold, silver, jewelry in India were plundered by the Turk, Afghan, and Mongolians. According to the record, King Muhammad of Afghanistan did not hesitate to order to burn the temple. That cost Indian a hundred million gold coin and two hundred years of labor. The soldier burned it to ashes with a paraffin oil. At the time, Muslim king ordered to kill Buddha monk in large lumber. On the one hand, Buddhist monk with a shed head were easy to identify, where Brahmins looked like lay people. On the other hand, Walter believed that Hinduism was more resilient than Buddhism, and the Hindu warrior were always ready to fight, which was their duty. Anyone who died in battle would ascend to heaven. So Hinduism remained alive in an area long occupied by Islam, as they perpetuate their faith and sustain their will to fight with the spirit that comes from dialect, vernacular language, and popular literature. The epic heroism of the folk in the form of the literature that depict fighting aggression and brutality for justice, and preserving Indian culture supported the rise of Indian spirit. Even Turkish rule, North India, do not assimilate Hindu into Muslim. Conversely, as A.K. Walter noted that Buddhism in this period was excessively philosophical and could indeed be described a collegiate tradition. The teaching would mostly circulate in the universities rather than among the people. When Buddhism was extinguished by the Islamic regime with the final blow, as Will Duran commented, the Hinduism obliterated Buddhism with a brotherly embrace. Brahminism subsumed Buddhism into Hinduism by declaring the Buddha as the one incarnation of Vishnu. The ancient Orthodox accepted the return of Buddhism that had been a heresy to Hinduism. The tolerant Brahminism stopped sacrificing and incorporated the Buddhist ideal of equality of all beings and the non-killing into the Hindu Orthodox rituals. Buddhism went into history in India. In the conclusion of this analysis, Indian Buddhism had never established an ethical or secular life, a socialized system of knowledge, and constructed an organization for lay followers. It lacked a connection to secular life and failed to establish a real world system. This is the main reason why Buddhism declined in India. The historical contribution of Tzu Buddhism, as I believe, lies in the development of the ideal of living Buddhism and humanizing the Bodhisattva. The Tzu Chi marriage society and the system of Tzu Chi volunteer established by the founder Master Zheng Yan over the past half century is one of the most rigorous lay organization among ancient and contemporary Buddhist society. This is true from the number of followers to the cohesiveness of the volunteer organization. Such also strive 
to establish an ethical system for the life of lay people, including the famous Ten Precepts of Chiji. This is a new development in the course of Buddhist history. Chiji's idea is not to merely give the Dharma, but to use the compassion altruism of the Dharma to save sentient beings, both materially and spiritually, so they can go from being recipient to being givers eventually to others. Such a vision is to achieve the fulfillment of body, material, and spiritually for all sensual beings. Instead of just transmitting Dharma, as we discuss this in more deep depth in the later section. Now we look at the Buddhism in ancient China. According to Arthur Wright, the period of Buddhism adaption to China was at the end of Eastern Han Dynasty and during the Wei Jing and Southern Dynasty. At the time, each class found its foundation in Buddhism. In the case of the king, after this fortune emperor invade China, they did not want to rule by Confucianism because they was the Han system ideology. But they also knew that the tribal system which they won the world now but could not rule China from the horses. They did not want Confucianism not only because it was the system, the old dynasty they had replaced, but because the use of Confucian would have to involve the Confucian's entire family system that could be detriment of foreign rulers. In this period, Buddhism provided the foreign emperor with an ideological basis for the governance. Buddhism came from the West, and many of the Hmong were foreigners. So using them would not involve the nepotism behind them. Moreover, this foreign emperor considered themselves as a wheel-turning sage king, like the Buddha. The five Buddha of the Yungang Grottoes as the statue of five Northern Wei emperors. The Yungang Grottoes are the earliest Buddhist cave in China where the Buddha was a prince and this king took the Buddha as their role model and claimed themselves to be a wheel turning sage kings. On the other hand, some noble were migrated to the south and remained wealthy in the midst of war, believed that they are reincarnated as a great Bodhisattva who received great blessing from their past life. While the masses would suffer in the war and displaced, so they expected the pure land in afterlife. This is why the pure land sect emerged during the Jing dynasty, created by Master Hui Yuan. The emperor Shen Huan wanted to see Mang Hui Yuan, who, however, was unwilling to meet the emperor and did not support the Mang to pay homage to him. When Mang do not bow down before king, written by Master Hui Yuan, offer a new kingdom of Buddha away from the worldly monarchy. It is the pure land for common people, who suffer war and for intellectuals who do not want to subjugate to foreign emperors. In contrast to hierarchy, regime, and authority of Southern Buddhism, Buddhism in China move toward leaving the kingship. During this period of Wei, Jing, and Southern and Northern dynasty, every class, from king, noble, to common people, all found life belonging in Buddhism. The king were incarnated, the will, turning sage king. The noble were great bodhisattva and the collectual being, and the common people pray for a pure land in the afterlife. This is an important historical adaption of Buddhism in China. Buddhism was supposed to be in its heyday during the Tang Dynasty, when it was fully integrated with the commerce and the empire. Jing Hua Chen from the UBC argued that the heyday of Buddhism reached its peak during the Wu Zetian Dynasty. Buddhism then, by virtue of commerce and the empire, command a far-reaching influence. The Dunhuang Grottoes were built over centuries. The Kidamata's long Buddhist cave symbolized Buddhist art, 
supported by far-reaching commerce. Whether from the West or from the East, merchants prayed here for the blessing of the Buddha and Bodhisattva in their journeys, and the carved statue and murals were being grateful for their abundance. Buddhist temple accumulated so much wealth, incurred the jealousy of kings. Meanwhile, Confucian scholar learned the four book and five classic in Confucianism as a way to enter officialdom. Against such a backdrop, the restoration of orthodox Chinese culture arose. Especially Anlu Shan Rebellion made the Confucian and the emperor wary about the country in the western regions that may intervene China domestic affairs. As An Lushan was from western country, and Buddhism came from the western region too. For the fear of western power coveting Han's land, and the rejection of Buddhism become catalyst for the revival of Han culture. In ancient China, there were three emperors who eliminated Buddhism. In 840 AD, Emperor Wu purged Buddhism, confiscated the temple properties, and returned a large number of monks and non to lay life, which did great harm to Buddhism. From then on, Buddhism declined, together with the agricultural and with the lower and middle class. In such a political climate, Mr. Bai Zhang founded agricultural Jain, so that he could live down on his own farming and be self-reliant and live the life law line for Buddhism. Primitive Buddhism did not attach importance of, to farming, because farming would kill, which is forbidden by the Dhammagupa Vinaya. In the end of the dynasty, however, in order to survive, Jain Master Bai Zhang adapted the Buddhism gradually to the way of Chinese organization. The law said by monk Dao Xuan was still Indian, but the law said by Jain Master Bai Zhang was Chinese law, including the abode in a patriarchal system, in which the abode could even beat the bhikkhus when they made mistake. In the tradition, Chinese thought there was always a patriarchal ethic. Surely, the beating was not intended to oppression or harm, but was like a father teaching the children out of love. The Buddha Sangha that absorbed Confucianism was fully established at the Jain Master Bai Zhang. Chinese Buddhism gradually moved toward agriculture and became uncoupled from commerce a phenomenon that arose after the extinction of Buddhism. Jain Buddhism led Buddhism back to the primitive Buddhist path of self-cultivation, focused on inner insight and liberation. Every culture and Jain are combined. Jain is supposed to be returned to the self-cultivation and insight of primitive Buddhism, not relying on philosophy, knowledge, or the scriptures, but on the intuitive illumination of the self-nature in daily life and farming. During the Ming Dynasty especially, after Wang Yangming, Buddhism declined even more. Wang Yangming's philosophy of mind was closer to Buddhism. Therefore, to study things, to acquire knowledge, to be sincere, to have a rightful mind, represent the thought and self-cultivation in Buddhism. And as to cultivate oneself, to raise one's family, to govern the country, and to harmonize the world are the Confucian wisdom of entering the world. Wang Yangming incorporated the Buddhism featuring, cultivating the mind into Confucian system of entering the world which led to the decline of Buddhism. Buddhism was subjugated to the Confucian system. After the Ming Dynasty, the uneducated class entered the Sangha and gradually merged with the Taoist craft. The development and decline of Buddhism in China is the same as in India. The upper level of thought was Buddhism, but entry into the world was in the hand of Brahmins. Buddhism lack of exposition and construction of knowledge of the world. 
led to its eventual reduction to supplementary system rather than mainstream system. The single way of liberation in Buddhism did not enter the very sphere of knowledge in society and did not establish a dense, complex, yet deeply lived social value and knowledge system, including a religious practice system like Christianity, Brahmin, and Muslim. For any religion to become a mainstream religion, the construction of a comprehensive social knowledge system is necessary. Islam, Christianity have long established their secular knowledge and value system. I do not have time to elaborate, but uh, you may take a look at my essay later on. Those construct of the secular system did not appear or were not emphasized in the development of Buddhism. Buddhism was absorbed by Confucianism in this period, almost a complete abdication to Confucianism in the real world. This is why there is a saying that endeavor from Confucianism retreat into the Taoism and disease in Buddhism. Buddhism is the ultimate belonging only. The common people grew close to ritual, mysteries, charm, chanting a more formalist part of Buddhism. This is undoubtedly a replica of Indian Buddhism. Buddhism in China declined at the Ming Dynasty and in the Qin Dynasty. The Chinese intellectual rule by Confucianism and the common people in general turned to Taoist craft. In India, the upper class intellectual revealed Brahmin discipline, and the common people tend to Brahmin mystery, incantation, and rituals. The decline of the Chinese Buddhism repeated the fate of Indian Buddhism. When temple Buddhism declined in the Ming and Qin dynasty, lay follower play a crucial role in reviving Chinese Buddhism in the late Qin dynasty. Yang Wenhui became a pioneer of Buddhist education in the 20th century. He saw the decline of Buddhism and decided to revive by printing the scriptures. In 1908, Yang Wenhui founded the Jatavana Hermitage, which became the first new Buddhist education school. In modern China and had a significant impact on the development of modern Buddhism. During this period, he called away more than 10 monks and lay elite, such as Mr. Tai Shi, Mr. Liao Wu, Mr. Xu Yun, and Tan Si Tong and Zhang Tai Yan. In 1910, Yang Wenhui founded the Buddhist Research Society at the Jingling Sutra Publishing Office bring together elite and lay the foundation for modern Buddhism in China. In the early 20th century, when Tai Shi Master advocated Buddhism for life, it was the time of the Japanese invasion of China. When the people were being ravaged by war, Master Tai Shi advocated that Buddhists should also think about the way to survive and save the country. The world life is used to respond to the long misunderstanding of Buddhism as only talking about extinction and emptiness. The world human respond to the parochial folk Buddhist practice of emphasizing ghosts and God. The meaning of light responds to the impression that Buddhism only provides liberation from death. Refuting the misconception that study Buddhism is to study death in the lay traditional Chinese Buddhism. Mr. Taishi advocate a more active involvement of Buddhism in social reform and share responsibility of Buddhism for the suffering of the nation. At the math, Mr. Ying Sun was strong advocate of all Buddha come out of the human world and have not become Buddha in heaven, as here in the Echo Tarika Agama, which state that the way to Buddhahood lies in the life and in this world. Humanistic Buddhism proposed by Master Ying Sun, which is also the fundamental teaching of Mahayama Buddhism, emphasized on the unity 
of independent arising and happiness of nature, which not only do not contradict each other, but depend on each other. Mr. Yingsun also advocates that the Bodhisattva complete self-benefit with altruism. He said, before one can save oneself, one must first save others. And here the Bodhisattva begin to develop his vow of might. The Bodhisattva is born out of great compassion and remain good ever. Great compassion is the root, secular wisdom, and wisdom of emptiness are all cultivated through compassion. A sutra in many meaning say, though a bow bent is sick, but its bow will be strong enough to ferry people. The bow is Buddha's teaching. Even though the bow bent has not yet attained enlightenment, he would have reached the other awakening shore along with the passengers when the bow reached the shore. The altruist path to Buddhahood is the characteristic of humanist Buddhism advocated by Master Ying Sun. Let's come to Venerable Ying Sun's disciple, Master Zheng Yan, the era in which Master Zheng Yan lived is much more stable than that of Master Tai Shi, Master Hong Yi, and Master Ying Sun. In 1966, Master Zheng Yan founded the Tsuji Mary Society in Hualien a remote area in eastern Taiwan we are standing here now, in the hope that the Buddha for immeasurable mind, compassion, mercy, bliss giving would help pain removing, promote social peace, achieve happiness, and the purification of human mind. At the time of her convert, Master Ying Sun encouraged Master Zheng Yan to bear in mind for Buddhism and for sensual being. Master Zheng Yan said that the six words were the spirit and goal of her lifelong endeavor. Master Zheng Yan's view of social reform emphasized that the pure land is in the human world and at hand. Nirvana is in the present moment. Enlightenment is in the present mind. And purity is in the present good days. So she emphasized altruistic action in which the true meaning of life is rooted. As Master Zheng Yan said, the sutra is the way. The way is the path, and the path must be walked upon. Master Zheng Yan promote Jing Shi lineage, which believe that the diligent practice and purity of mind is the way to enlightenment. And the path of Tsuji sect must be with compassion for the benefit of human world. She and her monastic disciple are self-reliant and do not take offering, but devote themselves to the masses and help all sensual beings. This is an example of the Buddhist practice of self-saving and the saving others. Saving means enlightenment. The establishment of such school Buddhism provides a new path for Buddhist social improvement and salvation on earth. The promotion of Chuji Four mission and A footprint has allowed people to move from charity good deed to all deeds of goodness, allowing the Buddhist philosophy to contact directly with professionalism in contemporary society and make a substantial impact. With this Buddhist foundation, Chuji has appropriately incorporated with the spirit of Confucianism and the Western scientific rationality and this able to adapt to society and transform the modern world to a certain extent while promoting the socialization of Buddhism. In his book, The Marxist Dharma, published in 2007 by Professor Richard Madison, he is also my discussion today. And Professor Madison said that uh, he commend the significance of Chuji to contemporary Buddhism that Tzu-Chi is one of the most important forces in the Renaissance of religion in Taiwan. As Master Ying Sun said, primitive Buddhism did not attach importance to material improvement. Tzu-Chi has developed four missions, charity, medicine, education, humanity, and environmental protection, all which are rooted to improve the life of the human world.
This is one of the influences of Chi on the historical development of Buddhism. Richard Gombrich, the founder of OCBS, he said that Chi turned narrative into a kind of Sangha. Master Zheng Yan embodied the ideal that all sensual beings can become Buddha, and that all human beings can be sage, a Confucianism highly expected. The monasticization of lay followers is an important creation of Chi and for Master Zheng Yan. It means the idea of humanizing the Bodhisattva. I think that this is the second contribution of Chi on the historical development of Buddhism. The third influence of Chi is the establishment of an ethical system for lay people. The traditional Buddhism lacked a system of ethic for lay people. The Chi Buddhism established the ethic and ritual for monastic life and for ten precepts of Chi for lay people, a combination of the five precepts of the traditional Buddhism, and other principle and ritual of life adapt to the modern society. This is the beginning and foundation of Buddhist teaching to establish the ethic of lay people. In the future, when the time is ripe, with Chi led the Catholic Ecumenical Council establish a complete Chi code of conduct for every aspect of life, an ethical system of serious trend and with a common covenant. It's not certainly at this moment. Chi need to develop an ethical code of life for monastic masters as well as for lay followers. The canon law of Catholic Ecumenical Council has a strict system of regulation for the Pope, Bishop, Priest, Nun, and, and faithful lay people in general. I think that when the time is ripe, Chi may build a Chi canon law assembly to discuss the system of organization, the mechanism of decision making, the order of life, and the ethical system for various practitioners. There are three pillars to build up the foundation of Chi school of Buddhism, which must include the philosophical system, the organizational system, and the way of practice Dharma to reach ultimate enlightenment. These three pillars go hand in hand. The philosophical system of Master Zheng Yan is the fundamental to Chi sect. The practice of Chi Buddhism must enter the world and does not leave the world. Thus, Chi must balance its public characteristic and religious aspect. The challenge of the Chi Buddhism is that it must integrate its position as public charity with the religious orientation. The former embodied the latter, and the former is made through the latter. I believe that Chi is still in the process of constructing these three goals. And in the fourth Chi Forum held in 2016, Master Zheng Yang explained the meaning of the Chi School of Buddhism. She said, In the 51st year of Chi, the official transmission of the Jing Shi Dharma, as well as the official establishment of the Chi Path, the Chi School of Buddhism has been formally established in October of this year, which 2016. And an international forum is held to establish the Chi sect and to make a statement. The participants were all religious figures and the professor of international renown. From the United Kingdom, from the United States, mainland China, Indonesia, Thailand, and Nepal, Buddhism, Catholic priests, and Islam were all present. I am really grateful to hear them talk. They are all good command about Chi, and they are all very positive about the Chi school of Buddhism. So now I want to say to you that this year, 2016, marked our official establishment of the Chi school of Buddhism. We are not a pure land sect or a Zen sect. If someone asks you or asks us what sect we are, we say the Chi sect of Buddhism. So that's Master Zheng Yan's uh, uh, teaching and statement to the volunteers. The Chi Buddhism practice in Dharma, in the real world, 
and all in must be diligent. Master said, Chi Chi has taken the way of great love for 50 years and will continue so forever. As I suggested, the decline of Buddhism in India and China is due to the lack of secular knowledge system, a complete ethical code of secular life, and the rigorous organization of lay people. So from observation, the idea of Chi Buddhism is to strengthen the Chi discourse to a true universal value and to establish a model of civilization. Chi and future Buddhism must continue to develop a comprehensive knowledge system which apply Buddhist philosophy to every professional field. That might include economy, governance, technology, philanthropy, medicine, humanity, education, art, communication, environment, and so on. Second, to build an ethic system for the lay follower and practitioners. Third, we organize its follower that can be adapted and accepted by the modern world. Accordingly, the future of Buddhism must develop a universal value, a new form of belief system, thus create a new civilization and a new way of human life. Thank you again for all your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Her, for this highly inspirational and sweeping take on Buddhism, um, its uh, fluctuation and its significance to our present world. And also, you define so well Ji's aspiration and what Ji can make a difference. We have two discussions. And first, I want to invite Professor Alice Anna DeVito uh, to comment Dr. Hur's lecture. Professor Alice Anna DeVito is the chair of the Department of English Language and Literature and chair of the Foreign Language Education Center at Tsuji University, Taiwan. She's a historian of modern Buddhism in China, Taiwan, and Vietnam with a special focus on women. She has an ongoing interest in the genres of hagiography and biography in Buddhist traditions, including the life of Tinat Han and Dharma Master Yixing. In 2018, she held the Shenyan Foundation Visiting Fellowship in Chinese Buddhism at National Chenzhi University in Taiwan. Professor Tevito is the author of Taiwan Buddhist Nuns and the forthcoming work, Woman, Buddhism, and Modernity in China, 1900 to 1950, as well as many articles and book chapters on Chinese and Vietnamese Buddhism. Mm -hmm. She holds a doctoral in history and East Asian language from Harvard University. Uh, we're very proud to have her. <laughs> um, and has taught courses in history and historiography to post undergraduates and graduate students in Taiwan, the United States, and mainland China. Um, um, Dr. DeVito. Well, thank you, Professor Wang, uh, for your very kind introduction. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, and also, thank you to Professor He. Uh, for inviting me, um, also Professor Wang and the whole, all the organizers to, for inviting me. It's a great honor. Um, and also I'd like to thank the translators too. So thank you so much. Um, these are my remarks. You know, many scholars discuss the rise and development of the Siji Global Organization led by Master Zheng Yen in the context of Taiwan history after 1945 and or Tsuji's evolution in the context of the Buddhist revival in the early 20th century. As we just heard, Dr. He takes on the far more daunting task um, to analyze Tsuji's rise and development in the light of Indian and Chinese Buddhist history. Dr. He primarily takes a Weberian approach. Um, it seems with reference to Weber's essay, Hinduism and Buddhism, 1917 
and maybe uh, uh, Weber's 1916 essay, Confucianism and Taoism. But due to the limits of time and the fact I'm neither a Buddhologist or an Indologist, I can't address particulars of doctrinal processes. Um, I can't offer that much insight about Buddhism in India. Instead, I have three um, points I wanna make or topics very briefly, the strengths and weaknesses of Weberian analysis, the decline and revival in Chinese Buddhist history. Uh, we heard a lot about decline. Um, and then we're gonna talk about Master Taishu's revival, right? And then the, the last one is the question of institutional sustainability. It affects every organization. Um, and so I'll, we can think about comparing Tsuji with three other ones. These are global international organizations. There's Thich Nhat Hanh's Plum Village, there's Soko Gokai's uh, International, and Chiratna's Buddhist Order and Buddhist Community. So let me first go to strengths and weaknesses of Weberian analysis. You know, Max Weber, like Marx, Spengler, Toynbee, Huntington, they took a meta-historical and comparative approach to find reasons for historical development, the rise and fall of civilizations, and so on. Marx looked to economic factors as the base, and then Max Weber, in a conscious critique of Marx, looked to cultural factors. So the main question actually that um, that the main question that concerned Marx and Weber was why did industrial capitalism rise in England, arise in England first? And at the great risk of oversimplifying, we can say Weber points to two phenomena, the so-called Calvinist work ethic, where success in business might be evidence of God's blessing and the disenchantment of the world. Uh, which means the mysteries of religion giving way to rationalization and bureaucratization. <laughs> uh, now, both, both Marx and Weber use India and China as counter case studies in their arguments. Weber actually did read Pali texts translated into English and German, but he was neither a Sinologist nor a Buddhologist. And like many scholars of his time, he focused on sacred texts texts. Um, you know, they didn't really have that many sources yet um, in the early 20th century. You know, he didn't, char he characterized the Buddha as a prophet, like the prophet of the Bible. It doesn't exactly fit. He didn't know enough about the fourfold Sangha. He didn't know about lay groups that much. He didn't know about the socioeconomic function of Chinese temples or know enough about the Vinaya or temple administration rules. He characterized Buddhism as world renouncing and world denying. Um, he didn't understand the bodhisattva ideal. He was looking mostly at um, Pali texts. He said the goal of Buddhism is nirvana, an eternal dreamless sleep. So in some, Weber lacked the knowledge and sources to interrelate religions to social, political, and economic currents, according to what we have today, our scholarly sources. But See Professor Ch uh, Chen Jinhua, he worked on um, monasteries and he shows us the political economy of monasteries. But having said this, let's not let, we shouldn't let this stop us from engaging with, with Weber, um, his ideas, for example, about charisma, charismatic leadership, uh, I will touch upon below still, we should still be challenged by it. Um, and now I'll talk about decline and revival. And, you know, I put it in quotation marks. So the decline of Buddhism since the Tang Dynasty, you know, we hear that a lot. It's a recurrent trope in many accounts of the history of Chinese Buddhism. But when we say Buddhism, what does that mean? A certain sect, certain practices and institutions? Are we judging by the degree of political influence, um, how close, you know, its influence on statecraft? Um, are we talking about numbers and constitution of the Sangha? Should we include the more popular or the more widespread um, 
three-in-one religion, you know, Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism, the popular religion. What kind of lay associations do we mean? When we talk about China, China is a big empire. China is a huge place. What, uh, what region are we talking about? And to quote Gilbert Chun um, in 2019, it has become clear to many that indications of decline were often rhetorical devices deployed for special agendas. You know, oh, the, the monasteries are in decline, let's close them. Oh, the, the monks are corrupt, let's arrest them. You know, so sometimes it's a, uh, there's a rhetorical, a political agenda behind this. Um, it may or may not directly reflect what's happening on the ground. Um, here is a long quotation by art historian Marsha Weidner. She looks at the decline thesis. Scholars generally agreed that Chinese Buddhism and its art peaked in the Tang Dynasty and then steadily declined in the Ming and Qing dynasties. This judgment was not based on demographics for the faith continued to grow in popularity and to insinuate itself ever more thoroughly in Chinese culture after the Tang. But if you look at it, you perceive that there's a decline in Buddhist leadership, Buddhist influences statecraft, um, intellectual rigor, perhaps. Um, if you see that, then you'll say, oh, decline. But this is interesting. Histor um, historians have begun to let go of the biological model of birth, fluorescence, and decay, and to evaluate later Chinese Buddhism on its own terms not necessarily regarding it as better or worse that went before, but as something distinct that invites different modes of research and analysis. Um, and so I think that's interesting to think about the biological model. We don't, we don't have to um, always be bound by it. And um, more recent scholarship has expanded into areas beyond normative doctrine and intellectual history to include popular and folk Buddhist practices. If you think about it, think of Feng Menglong's stories. You know, there you can hear karma, heavenly retribution. It seems like really it's part of the cultural landscape of all the Chinese before and now. Buddhist ideas infuse Chinese art. Gregory Chopin tells us, look at epigraphical and archaeological evidence, um, not only text, and you'll see you'll see new types of things. But at any rate. Um, here's a list of, of books, there's so many more. There are books talking about the revival and flourishing of Buddhism after the Tang and Sung. You know, they're talking about on the lay, uh, lay level. Uh, there's a monk, Zhu Hong. Um, I, uh, Professor Eichmann's Chinese Buddhist Fel Fellowship, a lay group. Uh, Professor Zhang Wu's the, in the Reinvention of Chan Buddhism, 17th century. Uh, women in late imperial China, who are devoted to Guanyin. Um, Kai Sheng's history of Chinese Buddhist faith and life, you know, daily life of, of believers. So I, I think these are all really good works we can, we can take a look at. And, um, oh, and I must say, I, I think we shouldn't forget about the Qing dynasty. It's, rich top, it's a rich topic for further research. The Qing government, they were patrons of some, um, Chinese Buddhist temples. And don't forget about Thai Tibetan Buddhism. Um, some scholars say Tibetan Buddhism played a large role in shaping the Qing governing ideology. Uh, and as far as Ch uh, Chinese Buddhism, late Ch Qing and early Republic, there are so many sources being found now uh, waiting to be studied. And, you know, remember Holmes Welch? In 1930, he said, um, China had 2,067, uh, sorry, two, 267,000 Buddhist temples and 738,000 monks and nuns. And that was according to the Republican government's um, record. So we have to think again about how much of a decline Buddhism was in. But there's no doubt about it, 19th century, Taiping Rebellion, foreign invasions, destabilized the entire empire and Buddhist institutions suffered a lot, burned to the ground by the Taipings. Um, and as we know, late Qing and early Republican government, they confiscated temples, they confiscated temples to use for schools, military and government offices. And this spurred Tai Xu and many other people, many other Buddhists to get organized 
uh, fight back, make Buddhism stronger. So that's where we come in with the, the 20th century Buddhist revival, organize themselves, carry out reforms and realize or actualize Ren Jin Fu Jiao, Buddhism for the human realm. So um, now I'll turn to part three, the question of institutional sustainability. It's, you know, in terms of doctrine, organization and membership, all institutions face this challenge at some point. Um, and our friend Weber talks about <laughs> charismatic authority and its evolution. And you, you know this, uh, charismatic authority uh, involves, according to Weber, it involves a type of organization or type of leadership, which authority derives from the charisma of the leader. And that means charisma was used in the very early um, Christian communities in the first century AD. And it meant a gift of God, a gift from God that showed you were a good leader. <laughs> so um, um, Max Weber took this Christian term and applied it to his leadership theory. Um, I am oversimplifying this, but Weber suggested a developmental process where after the charismatic founder passes away, leadership might become patriarchal and then a modern leadership form is bureaucratic and based on law. But we have to ask, how does this process really develop? Um, and can't several types of leadership exist at once? Um, and the oh, very such charismatic leader, our master Jung Yen, um, there is one book at least about her charisma. Um, we, Julia Huang's 2009 book, Charisma and Compassion, Zheng Yin and the Buddhist Suji Movement looks at um, Master Zheng Yin's charisma and the effect of bonds between leader and her devotees. But that was 2009, that book. So in 11 years since, the organization has grown so much more in so many ways. I have no time to tell you, but there's so many topics for everyone to study. It's time to update Professor Huang's and many other people's findings. Perhaps most of all is to research how Suji has been developing the Jing Sadharma lineage and the Suji school, as we just heard from Professor He. Now, Professor He, Professor He's lecture folk, well, he talked about the Suji million, millions and millions of lay followers. Um, we also, and he mentioned the nun, there are at least, there are about 200 nuns at the Jing Sa abode. And there's also a new group. It's called the Pure Practitioners, um, the Jing Shou Shi. And it's relatively new. They, um, are, they are celibate, but the, and they live at the Jing Sa abode, um, but they work in the four missions. And they're very important. They have an important role to play in transmitting um, the Dharma lineage and the Siji school. And furthermore, there's obviously lay, there's local lay members. This is um, recently in Mozambique. Siji is working very hard in Mozambique and training um, Mozambicans to lead Siji in their own country. So it's for the long time now, it's not only Hua Chao, right? It's uh, many local people too. So that's another interesting thing we should think about in the future. Um, how the various groups of disciples and volunteers will work together to continue this huge global organization that it's Siji. Um, and Dr. He said Siji needs an ethical code of life, perhaps what I think he said we should have like Vatican II or something. Um, how to make an ethical code of life for monastic masters, monks, and lay people. Figure out the organization structure of this whole Tsuji organization. Well, it will be instructive to compare what other global groups are doing. We have Thich Nhat Hanh, I mean, Chinese is Yi Xing Chan Shi, and is Plum Villa's tradition. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh is a Vietnamese monk. He's now 95 years old. He's incapacitated from a stroke. He's in Vietnam. But in the 1960s, he founded a new order called the Order of Interbeing. Due to the American War, he was exiled in France. He founded, he gathered lay followers and founded Plum Village. And from there, 
his lay organization grew around the world and they're all self-run. There's no centralized organization for the lay people. Um, his teachings draw on Mahayana and Theravada and psychological insights and so on. And you, I'm sure you know about this. He's developed engaged Buddhism with uh, based on mindfulness. His, his um, lay followers have the five mindfulness trainings, which are the five precepts. Um, before his stroke, though, Thich Nhat Hanh really started to build up his monastic sangha of monks and nuns. And um, he has a new code. He has a new monastic code that he drew up. He or and he ordains his own monks and nuns. So he, I think he's placing his responsibility now on, on the sangha, his sangha, to keep his tradition going. I mean, there's still lay people, but I, I think really he he's um, concentrating on the uh, the monastics right now. Um, the next one is Soko Gakkai International, and this group was founded by another name in 1930 by two lay uh, laymen. And it's based on uh, the 13th century Japanese priest Nichiren, um, who developed a Buddhist practice, developed, uh, sorry, on the Lotus Sutra and the Bodhisattva ideal. And in Japan, there's many of these Nichiren um, offshoots. So, and this, this particular group was founded in 1930. The two founders were imprisoned by the Japanese government in the 1930s. One founder died in prison, the other founder led Soko Kai until 1960, and then the third founder leader took over from 1960, um, and he's still the head. He's 19, he's 93 years old now and still going strong. But they are only lay. They have um, international schools. They have, um, what is this now? They have community centers, think tanks all around the world. And they believe that each person has within the courage, wisdom, and compassion to face and surmount any of life's challenge. Based on core Buddhist principles, such as respecting the dignity of human life and the interconnectedness of self and environment, uh, Soko Gakkai engages in various peace activities, including human rights education, anti-nuclear weapons, and the efforts to promote sustainable development. And what is this value creation? Um, it's a little bit vague. The positive aspects of reality that are brought forth are generated when we creatively engage with the challenges of daily life. So nothing particularly Buddhist about that, but their practice is to chant um, the mantra, this mantra every day, uh, the Nambo Miao Fa Lian, uh, Lian Hua Jing, every day at least five times. There are no priests, no temples, but there are lay leaders and community centers. And it's unclear who's going to succeed Ikeda after he dies. Um, it's all up in the air, but it seems like his writing, they're trying to make Ikeda's writings into the core, the core uh, Dharma. And the last one we can look at is the Triratna Buddhist order and Buddhist community. This was founded by a a British Buddhist, his name is Dennis Lingwood. And um, originally it was called the Friends of the Western Buddhist Order. Dennis Lingwood founded this in London in 1967. Before that time, he had been in India and he worked with the Dalit Buddhists, the so-called untouchable Buddhists, the untouchables that became Buddhists in the 1950s. So he had he, he and Tri Ratna, they still have a lot of um, ties with Buddhists in India. So his name is actually Sangarashta. So the leader of Tri Ratna is named Sangarashta. He, um, he wanted to create an order, an order that's neither, neither Buddhist, uh, sorry, neither lay or monastic. So it's, it's a new kind. Some people, some of those order members are celibate. celibate. All order members take the three refugees and uphold 10 precepts. To support themselves, Tiratna encourages members to undertake community businesses according to right livelihood. So they support themselves by business according to the Buddhist idea of right livelihood to do no harm. 
Anyone could be a friend. Um, you can take part in meditation and classes at Buddhist centers around the world. They call themselves ecumenical. They draw from Tibetan Buddhism, Mahayana, um, Theravada, and so on. And they say, we just focus on the taking refuge and the five, the five precepts. Before the master, before the master Sangharashtra died, he already set up a Triratna International Council. And that's that's going to that that's the purpose of that is to coordinate the College of Public Preceptors, which ordain their order members, um, the order members themselves, and the larger community. So they actually have a, a very a very um, a good organization. Um, to carry on after the founders, he died uh, in 2018. But the big problem is that there are serious ethical problem scandals with, uh, according um, with, with Sangharashtra. So that might very well imperil their future. And of course, any sustainability of, of the sustainability of any group, most import importantly depends on young people taking the lead. So Saji is good. They have worldwide um, youth organization. They have an entire school system from kindergarten to graduate school, not just in Taiwan, but in many countries. Um, Soko Gakai also has a school system. Plum Village and Chiratna might have more difficulties with the younger generation, I think. But anyway, future comparative studies on the present and future of global Buddhism organizations like these await. I think it would be really great if we could make comparative studies with Saji. Um, unfortunately, I have to stop here. Um, Dr. Ho's paper opens up new paths for macro historical and comparative approaches. And thank you, Dr. Ho, um, for showing us all the new topics researchers can explore regarding Saji's unique contributions to Buddhism and the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Davido, for your, uh, you, you certainly add uh, more dimensions and perspectives on, on this and uh, give us um, a, a really a kind of different take on things and while, um, you know, to some extent also uh, make the whole discussion uh, more dimension, more dimensional in, in, in uh, so a lot of uh, food for thought, but uh, uh, let, let's um, um, hear from uh, uh, Professor Richard Masson. Uh, professor Richard Masson is uh, Professor Emeritus of Sociology at UC San Diego. He's also Distinguished Research Professor and Director of the UC Fudan Center for Research on Contemporary China at the University of California, San Diego. He's the author of 15 books. Um, moral order and religion in both the United States and China, uh, Chinese speaking societies. His book includes Habits of the Heart, Individualism and Commitment in American Life, which he co-authored with Robert Bala and others. Um, Democracy's Dharma, Religious Renaissance and Political Development in Taiwan, which he co-edited co with Becky Xu and um, Chinese pursuit of happiness, anxieties, hopes, and moral tensions in everyday life. Uh, Professor Masson. Well, th <clears throat> thank you very much for giving me a chance to hear this uh, wonderful talk by uh, Professor He and to take part in this uh, wonderful forum. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not an historian, I'm just a sociologist. And for me, it's impossible to comment in any detail on the immense amount of information and the very rich presentation on the history of Buddhism that uh, Dr. Ray Shang He has presented in his lecture. <clears throat> in any case, it would be impossible to do justice to this in such a short 10 minute uh, comment. So let me simply confine myself to the sociological framing of his historical narrative. <clears throat> The framing, as Professor DeVito says, is very much influenced by the theories of Max Weber, whose great work on the comparative history of religions talked about the rise of Buddhism in India and its interaction with various social classes and political powers. 
the overall story one gets from this is a story of how the original teachings of Buddhism were in the end diluted and corrupted by worldly social class and political power. And this indeed is the kind of story that Professor uh, He tells. But recently, <clears throat> there has been published a new book by Hans Joas, a German scholar who is now one of the most important sociologists of religion in the world. In this book, The Power of the Sacred, Professor Yoas has a strong criticism of Weber and urges us to find better alternatives to his theory. I believe that his book will provide the basic framework uh, going forward for religious comparative religious studies. So for the sake of argument, let me try to reframe uh, Professor Raishan He's narrative along the line suggested by, by Hans Joas, which I think is kind of cutting edge uh, new theory. According to Joas, <clears throat> a first problem with Weber's characterization of Asian religions is that it's based on very outdated information, as Professor DeVito has, has told us. But a more important problem is that Weber focuses too much on religious ideas and makes too much a contrast between these ideas and worldly interests. Yoas thinks it's much more fruitful to focus on religious experiences and to see how they are given shape by different kinds of organizations and institutions. He finds the model for such a study in the work of Ernst Trelsch, the Christian theologian, historian, and sociologist who was a close colleague and friend of Weber. Weber took important ideas from Trelsch, but Hans Joas thinks that Trelsch had a deeper understanding and Weber actually didn't learn enough from him. Rather than focusing, as did Weber, mainly on the development of religious ideas and their consequences, Trelsch, as Joas describes it, began his master work about the social teachings of the Christian churches with the lived experiences a worship of the Christ mediated through implicitly shared cultural understandings, which then formed ideals which could be embodied in and shaped by many different forms of organization, all subject to the contingencies of power configurations at different periods of history. Trelch confined himself only to the history of Christianity, and that was a weakness compared with Faber. But Yoas thinks that his basic approach to studying Christianity, the sociological approach, would be a best approach to the study of all kinds of world religions, including Buddhism. So let's try to apply this to the history of Buddhism that uh, Professor Ray Jean He tells us. As applied to this history, this would emphasize the many different varieties of Buddhist experience and practice. None would necessarily be seen as more or less pure than others there would be no forms in which the Buddhist vision would be perfectly realized, and different forms would become prominent in different contexts in history, shaped by the particular causes and conditions of the time. Under every circumstance, there is tension between Buddhism's sacred power and secular power, but often some melding of the two rather than a clear break. So for example, in the Sung dynasty, the Buddhist Sangha had lost much of the power that it had during the Tang, but Buddhist ideas became woven into the fabric of Neo-Confucianism and indeed into the whole fabric of, China, of Chinese society at, after that time. By the late 19th century, <clears throat> Buddhism was widely perceived as corrupt, but so were all the other major institutions of the late Qing. As part of the general corruption in the, 20, in the 20th century, Buddhism was not seen as having the resources to overcome the corruption and to help revitalize China. But reformer monks like Taishu sought to transform Buddhist practice in a way that would respond to the cultural challenges faced by a modern China. Taishu's project, of course, was cut short by war and revolution, but his disciple Yinchun brought his vision of humanistic Buddhism to Taiwan, and this led to the formation of a number of humanistic Buddhist organizations, Siji being the most prominent. Each of these adopted different forms of organization and practice 
to meet modern challenges. The Buddhist Compassionate Relief Foundation, Siji, is not formally a part of the Buddhist Sangha. It is a charitable organization, most of whose members and directors are lay people. It is run according to modern professional standards and uses the most advanced modern technology to further its work. But it carries out its work in ways that are infused with Buddhist values. These values are embodied in the Still Thoughts, Still Thoughts Abode, a monastery with now over 100 Buddhist nuns led by uh, Master Jungyan. The nuns lead a life stru structured by rigorous Vinaya rules, but they also help with the work of the Siji organization, which is led ultimately by Master Jungyan, but whose top echelons of leadership are lay Buddhists. The still, the still Thoughts vision is encapsulated in the Still Thoughts Dharma lineage prayer, which is sung before every spiritual practice, not only at the abode, but throughout Siji. It begins the Still Thoughts Dharma lineage is the path of diligent practice. We carry on the Dharma's essence and make great vows. The Siji school of Buddhism is a path through the world. That path is the Bodhisattva path of practicing wisdom and compassion toward all living beings in what they call a dharma ending degenerate age, like now. Although this may be a dim view of modernity, the lay members of the Tsuji Foundation are committed to using modern means to overcome the suffering of the age with compassion. For Tsuji members, their vows to follow the path are carried out in direct personal service to those in need, mainly suffering people but also a planet suffering from pollution. Direct engagement with people is the core of Siji's work. Whenever possible, for example, when giving out food or clothing to victims of disasters, <clears throat> they mobilize volunteers to present a gift face-to-face -face with a smile and a bow. From the point of view of experts in disaster management, this seems inefficient. But a study from Harvard's Business School of Siji's relief efforts in Haiti showed this his approach was actually more effective than others because it built morale among both givers and receivers. Sizi insists on giving help far and wide, and his members take special satisfaction in reaching beyond boundaries of ethnicity, religion, or politics. For example, their vision of a bodhisattva path leads them to rebuild mosques in Islamic communities and churches and Christian communities. They resolutely avoid any kind of proselytization although of cloaks, they would be pleased if anyone followed their example. <coughs> Thus, although direct service to afflicted people is at the core of its work, Siji commits itself to using modern technology and organizational methods to make their service as effective as possible. This is a new and creative way of taking on modern forms of organization and technology to practice compassion toward the suffering people of the modern world. But there is inevitably some tension between the Still Thoughts vision and the Still Thoughts or in, in the Tsuji organization. Fundamentally, it is a tension between tradition and modernity. The Still Thoughts lineage is both very conservative and very progressive. It is firmly based in classical Buddhist teachings, and its nuns leave the family and at least partially separate themselves from the world. But the emphasis in this lineage is on the bodhisattva path of practicing love and compassion for all living beings and indeed the whole earth. To help her lay disciples follow this path, Master Zheng Yan created the enormously successful Tsuji Foundation. Tsuji ultimately undoubtedly retains a Buddhist spirit, but a problem persists in how to maintain that spirit. Its size overwhelms the small abode of still thoughts. Its members all say that the abode is their spiritual home and they're absolutely reverential toward the charisma of Master Zheng Yan. But the very size and complexity of the Sidzi organization sometimes make, makes it difficult to maintain a simple and wholesome correct commitment to the Buddhist vision. This particular kind of fusion between a religious Sangha and a large charitable organization would not have been possible during the causes and conditions in India when the Buddhists lived and it would not have been possible in pre-modern China. It is a fusion between a Buddhist vision and modern forms of organization, 
under the causes and conditions of contemporary Taiwan and indeed the rest of the world. As in every era, this sort of fusion creates tensions between the religious vision because religious vision is always higher and deeper than any worldly organization can allow. So Chizhi provokes controversy sometimes uh, in Taiwan, sometimes, sometimes from other humanistic Buddhist organizations as from other forces in society. This is an overall healthy controversy and is to be expected with every religion and every era as it engages with its particular historical context and Professor He has talked about some of the path forward in creating a, a more general kind of code of ethics for Chichi and so forth. And that's the challenge that it faces that it goes into the future. So, thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Massin, for your very thoughtful com uh, comment. And again, we have a, a new perspectives and, and that uh, uh, really concur well with what uh, Dr. DeVito also said. Uh, but uh, clearly that we have a strong sense that uh, um, uh, Max Weber um, it, it is uh, someone that uh, we might want to have a second thought drawing on that uh, intellectual resource. I know a lot of um, uh, scholars in mainland China who essentially uh, still had that kind of um, uh, strong grip or, or try to hold on to Max Weber big time. But uh, thank you both for giving us this um, new perspective that we should know better now in this day and age when scholarship has advanced so much that the uh, you know new 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 evidence and new uh, paradigms are in that we should um, you know uh, be ready to embrace those. Um, well. Uh, Time is a bit tight, but I, I want to um, see if uh, 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 Dr. Ray, uh, Dr. Her, uh, has uh, any thought in response to uh, both Professor De Vito and Professor Masson's comment. Yes, I appreciate so much about the um, a comment from Professor De Vito and Professor Madison, both of them are my good friend. And especially Professor Madison, we've been know each other for more than 10 years. And I think they are right that uh, Max Weber's uh, uh, ideal and the study may not really updated, but his observation uh, in cooperated with the Master Ingsun and Japanese scholar and Will Duran that can conclude that some uh, his observations still very effective. And I think the, uh, the, the Hans Joas in Germany, uh, sociologist, you're talking about the believer and non-believer, and the debating between these two, and also uh, the sacred experiences that um, uh, uh, some, many scholars talking about, uh, like Paul Telix talk about religion is about experience. And so uh, I think uh, the, uh, the, the, the hand jaws is not about the talk about the organization, but talk about how the, uh, uh, the experience of religion can influence the other institution. He does not really care about how the uh, religion hold on a specific organization. And that's the most uh, Buddhist organization. We're not doing this this way, like a Jain is everywhere. It's a decentralized organization like a Buddha is a Sangha. It's really fluid, very decentralized. But look at the Tsuji, it's a very large organization and uh, it covers different missions worldwide, over 126 countries. It's a very big size as a ritual, med a, a, yes, a ritual medicine uh, concern about the uh, challenge and the contradiction of this uh, public interest and religious perspective, we always, uh, you know, have attention at it. So that's I, I propose that Suji might eventually establish in the the, the code of the uh, 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 of the conda for uh, for the lay people and the practitioners in every aspect. And that's the one hand to look at the Tsuji sustainable. And the other one I look at is the how Buddhism can really adapt to the modernity and how the how can the scholar or how can the Buddhist practitioner nowadays can apply the Buddhist uh, philosophy into different fields. And that's the most important 
for the Buddhist ideal can really adapt it and accept it by the modern society. Uh, it's rarely mentioned the Buddhist uh, Buddha's uh, philosophy on economy, on the poverty, on different fields, only provide the way to liberation. I think it limit the uh, Buddha's wisdom. And nowadays, if the Buddhism want to be, become a global and universalism and socialization of Buddhism, it must open up its discourse uh, to different fields. And that, I think, is also sociologist Han uh, George's uh, uh, advocate. He was trying to advocate the dialogue between the religion and non-believers. I think we still have many work to do. And thank you for the command. And I will you know, re reconsider the essays and uh, more adopt a different perspective to complete my essay and hopefully can publish it later on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, there, there are some, quite some questions uh, from the audience, but in the interest of time, I, I probably want to just uh, uh, pick uh, one uh, or, or consolidate. Uh, 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 one question that uh, is being raised um, is that with, with regard to Tsuji's uh, future direction. Um, this comes from uh, Pascal Gregoire, who um, was wondering in what way uh, Tsuji can uh, move forward. I guess the answer is already partly answered by, provided by uh, Dr. Her. Um, but, uh, and also it's interesting that uh, 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 Greg Gua asked um, when we talk about the possible next step, uh, are, you, are we talking about next 500 years uh, and, and, and or what? Uh, so in any case, and, and the question also is about uh, what are the conditions that would uh, kind of allow Tsuji to do certain kind of things uh, or, or allow us to predict what Tsuji uh, yeah. will do mm -hmm. down the road? Yeah, this is a good question. It's a really challenging question for for many uh, friends uh, that concern Tsuji or even in the uh, uh, insider of Tsuji members. I'm insider too. And of course, many of the insider uh, try to figure out how can sustaining the legacy of Tsuji, you know, that created by Master Zheng Yan. As I just mentioned, three pillars to sustaining Tsuji. One is the philosophy of Master Zheng Yan. One is the organizational structure that can accommodate as a medicine uh, concern, the public characteristic and the religious aspect. And the third it will be, uh, you know, the practice. How can uh, Tsuji members continue the altruistic compassion and through that to reach the enlightenment? Because enlightenment is, is the key form for Buddhism. So that, that's still very challenging. I think uh, Tsuji members uh, uh, working on that, and as I uh, also participate some aspect of it, and I think it's a good question, and the challenge is great because all religion uh, facing the challenge of modernity, the technology, the liberalism, and, and different uh, ideology now, and also political and economic challenge too. So I think it's not quite easy, but I, I think Tsuji will figure out these are three pillars. And not only that Tsuji uh, concerned their own uh, sustaining development, he has also concerned Buddhism development. So apply Buddhist philosophy, apply Tsuji's philosophy into different fields, aside from the four mission. I think they should expand their discourse in different fields. And that's a repeat my lectures uh, propose. And thank you, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um one of the takeaways we ha we can have from this discussion and uh, or in particular also from uh, Dr. Masson's comment is that the, the, the new uh, focal point is really experience, in other words, when uh, rather than the ideas. And then I think that uh, probably explains why Buddhism uh, has wide appeal to global audience, not that it is much of a religion to many, but rather it's a way of practice, way of cultivation. So we have 
Therefore, some uh, a member from the audience named Kevin Chu who asked um, a present of many people who like to participate in meditation and live in the temples for a few days, especially the high stressed group. So he wonders why they choose to experience it. Or he, there you go, the keyword experience. Uh, whether they, uh, why they choose to experience it, or more exactly why they choose Buddhism or Buddhist meditation sessions rather than other relaxing activities. And he thought um, Dr. Ho and uh, Professor Masson, uh, Professor DeVito, I guess uh, this is a question that is can, um, um, for, for all of you. Okay, let me uh, respond very quick is that the meditation. I think it's a tradition from Buddha, also a tradition from Brahmins. I think it sustained more than 6,000 years. I think that's the way to uh, calm down your spirit, to ascend your spirit. I think it's true, but meditation has a lot of different uh, methodology, different way of practicing. And but Chichi is not emphasized on meditation, uh, but instead they emphasize on altruistic uh, compassion action. Through altruistic action, people might also, uh, you know, uh, reach the you know transcendence and the purity of the mind. As my friend Richard Gombridge from Oxford said, that Buddhism is not only for meditation. And meditation not only cannot really equal to Buddhism. There are so many aspects that Buddhism convey. But now I know that this most popular meditation to different kind of people, non-believer, believer, non-Buddhist non or Buddhist. So I think it's good uh, exercise for for your mind to be become a transcendence and a purity. And that's my answer to the question. Thank you. Mm. Professor Madsen, do you have a quick answer for that question? Because I think that probably um, rather a, a kind of question a, a general audience would love to pose. I, I think meditation is one part of Buddhism, very, very important part. Uh, and different Buddhist groups and different traditions emphasize it more than others. Uh, Suji, you know, as Professor He has said is more activist, if you will, is is more uh, concerned about reaching out and giving direct help to uh, people in need. Uh, but you know, people still need meditation, and Siji uh, makes it possible. I think actually, in say the United States, Siji uh, has done marvelous work in helping people who are victims of various kinds of hurricanes and disasters and wildfires and so forth, and is very, very impressive. But in a way, it hasn't attracted as many uh, Americans outside the community of, of you know, Taiwanese diaspora as uh, maybe some other religious uh, Buddhist groups, uh, because we have many institutions here that help people in need. We have Catholic Relief Services, Jewish Family Services, on and on. And if people want to be involved in helping others, they can do it that way, and it's very available. Uh, and uh, groups that practice, for example, um, Chan meditation. Uh, like, uh, like, like, like the, you know, the Shangyan, Dharma Drum Mountain, for example, are maybe especially attractive to Americans, not just Chinese, uh, because there is something there, a, a way of meditating that uh, other parts of American culture don't have. And I think it's very important in a very stressful world to be able to calm one's mind and so forth. And so, it's attractive in this particular context under these causes and conditions, right? And uh, so I think different forms of practice uh, are become powerfully alive under different contingent circumstances, different causes and conditions. And say what is especially powerful in Taiwan or uh, other parts of Asia might not be quite so powerful right now in the United States because there are different needs and so forth. So. Meditation is one form. Some 
places and times and contexts and causes them more powerful, important than others. And, and the Tsuji direct help to others is important, but especially flourishes under certain circumstances. Thank you. Um, Dr. Navido, do we have a quick take on this? Um, hmm. Right, so um, meditation, the, the person asked, um, if going to a temple to learn meditation would be relaxing, um, I don't think it would be relaxing because, well, first of all, meditation is a practice. It's not something you would just learn in one short visit to a monastery. Um, and actually a monastery is, um, uh, it's run like a tight ship. So I wouldn't say it's relaxing. You're gonna get up at three o'clock in the morning. Um, and before you eat breakfast, you're gonna to have to have the morning service and do the cleaning. You know, it's run like a, sh it's, that's what I feel like, it's a ship. You're in the Navy, you know, it's like, there's a schedule. It's not, if you want relaxation, I don't know, you have to go somewhere else, but, um, but if you wanna learn meditation, uh, there's, you know, you don't have to go to a temple for that. There are a lot of, there are a lot of classes and centers. Um, at a temple, you learn many other things besides meditation, um, monastic discipline. You learn how this organization is run, uh, how a community lives together, makes their decisions. So I guess that's how I would answer it. Yeah. Thank you. This has been a really, really wonderful event and a great discussion. And one of the, um, what well, the Tsuji story reviews it in fact it, it, uh, it in some ways it challenges this whole old dichotomy of, between the sacred and the secular and as also as a um, um, a ray and 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 uh, our discussion pointed out you know uh, one of the success um, um, revelation that we can have is in, in fact um, if Tsuji successfully um, integrate the uh, some kind of religious organization, but more uh, a modern international organization as a, ch a charitable society that um, um, uh, thereby uh, it kind of uh, function in ways that the uh, pre-modern organization probably uh, couldn't. Um, so, uh, a lot, lots of food for thought, and uh, especially um, coming from our uh, speaker and uh, discussing the challenge of Max Weber's paradigm and all that, uh, the charisma and all that. So, um, but, but we're running out of time. Uh, I just want to thank um, uh, Dr. Ho for giving us this uh, sweeping take on this big picture issue of how to Buddhism uh, goes forward in, uh, in this global um, um, setting and, and our own time with our own challenges. I want to thank um, Dr. Davido and Dr. Masson for uh, giving us all these wonderful, wonderful, up-to-date um, theoretical and, um, and perspectives. And uh, now, uh, finally, I want to thank uh, our team, uh, which actually is a truly global team uh, from CamLab, I see Alina, uh, Elaine and Alina, and from Tsuji, Jesse, uh, Su Yi, Jiangu, and from UBC, Professor Jinghua Chen, Vicky, and Carol. Um, collectively, you made this event possible. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank Professor you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Wang and Professor Madison and Professor Divido. And thank you, Professor Chen Jinghua from UBC. And thank you all of your effort to make this lecture completed. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ray. And thank you, everyone. And uh, we shall continue this conversation down the road. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, very good. Okay. All right, thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, it's bye, great talk. everyone. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye now. Bye. bye, -bye. bye.